I would guess that if you walk into a crowded casino, maybe 10% of those customers think they're advantage players, but of those 10%, fewer than 1% have any hope of actually taking any substantial amount of money out of the casino. Casinos just don't like it when they get people in there who have the expectation of walking out the door with more money than they walk in with. Any card counter knows that heat comes quickly if you're counting cards. It's the thing that casinos look for first. The casinos, they feel emotionally toward card counters the way they feel toward cheats, so they hate you. Well, we really don't want your action here anymore, and if you're smart, you won't show your fucking face in here again. Okay, John, call him up, please. For the past four decades, blackjack players are, have been saying, oh, the game is over, it's the end of times, we're not going to get to play anymore because a new technology comes along. When I started playing in 1978, from that moment and every single year since then, I have had people tell me blackjack is dead, it's over, you can't make money anymore. And you know, then we went and made, you know, $10 million or whatever it was and, or, and uh, you know, Casey started his career. So it all depends on how you look at it. Most people realize the game of blackjack is vulnerable and can be beaten, but very few people take the time to master the skills necessary to do it and or build the required bankroll to play professionally. When I started playing blackjack, I always knew I wanted to play at the highest stakes available. I started playing at a very young age. I had a subscription to Arnold Schneider's Blackjack Forum and I read every issue cover to cover. I loved it. Realizing that there were people out there beating casinos for a living, I was just attracted to it. I would read books, I would go to websites, check out the forums, I had computer software that I would practice on on a regular basis. And at the time I was playing very low limits, learning the game, learning how to play, learning techniques. And I slowly built up a bankroll over the years. You know, I learned a lot of hard lessons. I went broke a few times, but it's when I really became a professional. There was a definitive point where I went from playing kind of under the radar at lower states recreationally without giving my ID to the point where I decided I was gonna set up credit lines and, and play at high stakes. And it took me years and years to get to that point where I had not only had the bankroll, but also had the skills to play blackjack at nosebleed stakes. This is where like my whole plan came together. And every weekend I was traveling from Berkeley, uh, where I was a full-time student, to Las Vegas, where I was working full-time as a professional blackjack player. It was a pretty exciting period of my life. My optimal high limit strategy required disclosing my identity and establishing credit lines all over Las Vegas. And I knew I only had one shot at this because once the casinos identify you as an advantage player, the whole game changes. I went to grad school with Casey, and while we were doing our homework together, I quickly understood that his lifestyle um, was not financed by working at Starbucks. What makes Casey so good at it? I mean, he's been playing the game for so many years that any little edge he'll find, he'll take advantage of it and push it to its maximum. There's something extremely satisfying about being the casino for a large sum of money. Even better when they pick up your, your tab on an enormous weekend of extravagance. I mean, that's a, that's a great feeling. Uh, not only winning, but them paying for the whole thing and knowing that you had the advantage the whole way and the whole time the casino was the sucker. Comps are what we give back to a customer who is willing to risk his money in the casino and play up to a certain level. We base comps on uh, the level of play of a customer. The extravagant lifestyle afforded to casino high rollers seems frivolous, but actually it's an important calculated element of a professional blackjack career. Comps range from room, to food and beverage, to spa, to expensive flight tickets, jet airfares, very expensive nightclub bills. We're talking about all the way to $50,000. For a big enough player, the sky is the limit. It adds up a lot, so it, it can probably add as much as 20 to 40% to your overall expected earn per hour if you really work the comp system well. Casinos are constantly looking for advantage players. So as a professional, a bit of acting is required. I'm ordering cocktails, I'm buying bottle after bottle of champagne, you know, Cristal, Dom Perignon. Uh, I'm throwing a party in the high limit pit and as long as I'm there gambling and partying, in their eyes, I'm not working. 
hiding your skill. Most people want to show off their skills. A blackjack player wants to hide whatever skill he may happen to have. And the more you can act like a complete jerk, the better off you are. So having some type of act that you feel comfortable executing really does distract them from evaluating your skills. In that time frame, I beat the Hard Rock for 1.4 million, which is probably my greatest score in my blackjack career. I didn't know how long it was gonna last. And it ends when you become so hot that you can't enter a casino and you can't play. And then all of a sudden you're unwelcome. And you don't know when that day is gonna happen. There's a very drastic change from being welcome to the casino to them basically throwing you out and even maybe even treating you like a criminal. The casino has a surveillance department that's very good. You know, they have cameras everywhere, personnel trained to look for people that either might be cheating or counting cards. They don't care you know, what you're doing, but if, if you're a threat to them, to their bottom line in any way, they want to get you out of there. The casinos have every right to bar you for doing an advantage play, for using your brain. You, you hate it, but yes, the casinos have the right to throw you out. Gambling is a state issue. Nevada law is that any business has the right to exclude anyone for any reason or for no reason at all, with the obvious exceptions of by statute, race, gender, other forms of discrimination. So casinos in Nevada have the right to exclude anybody they want. If they want to exclude card counters or people wearing green hats, they have the right to do it. And the casinos also have the right to 86U, formerly 86U, which means to read you the Trespass Act, which means if you return, then they can arrest you for having trespassed. In the relationship between casinos and advantage players, it's a thin line of love and hate. APs hate the casinos for limiting their play. Same time, APs love the casinos after crushing them, and the casinos hate them because they did. Your subsequent return to the premises will subject you to immediate arrest for trespassing. Some casinos are more friendly than others in getting rid of players. Some players are much more persistent than others in, in playing. In my opinion, the relationship between the casino and the advantage player should be a cat and mouse relationship. Obviously, I'm biased. It does seem like there's some illegal conduct that goes on either on the part of the casino or on the part of the card counter, but most of the illegal conduct or immoral conduct is done by the casinos. The player also enters this environment under the assumption that the game's going to be fair and that the casinos are going to act in a fair and legal manner. This is probably true for 99.9% .9 of casino players, but for advantage players, or players that are willing to risk enough money that could potentially disrupt the finances of the casino, this couldn't be further from the truth. Casinos, in my opinion, they're the worst of both worlds. They'll get people drunk, they'll take advantage of them. If you try to take advantage of them legally, then they'll employ illegal methods to stop you. It runs the gamut from illegal detentions, search and seizure, confiscating chips, cheating in the games. Casinos have refused to cash my chips. Casinos have stolen chips from me. Uh, I've had money illegally confiscated from me. I've been cheated numerous times. In the past, I have been drug in the back. I've been punched. Uh, friends of mine have been burned with cigarettes. Friends of mine have had their jaws broken. Friends of mine have been threatened to be murdered. I've seen intentional payoffs against me. I've been arrested for crimes I didn't even commit. I know people who have been beaten up. I was once drugged by a casino. Uh, casinos planted narcotics on a friend of mine that was being detained illegally. The list of casino crimes goes on and on with never anything but a slap on the wrist from local gaming authorities, which are supposed to regulate games, but we've found just, you know, protect casinos. People say, is it dangerous, you know, to play in these casinos? And I, I, I immediately say, no, I don't, I don't feel any danger. I never felt really the danger, you know, but then I think about uh, visiting Ken Houston on his hospital bed when he had 73 broken bones in his face from a security guard that punched him just outside a casino in Reno. There is a safety issue. I generally feel that I'm safe in a casino, um, but it's not unusual for security to get out of line and for them to overreact to the situation. This is part of the reason. What happens is they send out these bolo reports they say, be on the lookout for this player, and they say, he's got this skill, this skill, this skill, and this history, and one, one here and one there, and the casinos freak out. Usually they tend to very quickly overreact and bring security 
police and other goons to uh, treat us like criminals. But playing is my job. That's what I do professionally. I want to play and I don't feel that I should quit playing just because they're aggressive and they're willing to break the laws and intimidate me. You know, from being a, both a player and a casino operator, uh, I, I'm just kind of sometimes I'm amazed at some of the techniques that the casinos use to try to discourage card counter. As any card counter or other casino player would know that the hardest part about the game is avoiding the heat over an extended period of time. The casino's willingness to break the law and create a hostile environment for advantage players forces advantage players to take countermeasures. I've used disguises, I use camouflage when I play, I use aliases. I would say creativity and hard work are the two most important characteristics that an AP can possess. I lasted for years and I had these acts. I was a Texan, I'd talk like this and come on in and I'd hide that whiskey and I'd put tea in there and I'd knock them down, order a double wild turkey, make it a quadruple wild turkey and a beer. And I'd already have an O'Doul's poured into the beer I had and this one here and I'd knock them down, knock that down. But I'm talking like this, I'm acting like that, I'm tipping like crazy. I've done some ridiculous things to try to avoid heat or detection or whatever, but they, they were kind of ridiculous and I got caught. You know, I got dressed up as a woman. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know? Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. Hello, Richard. Hello. Good to be here. All right. Tonight's guest will be Casey, a professional gambler. At the time, in the Peacock Lounge, which used to be the high limit pit in the Hard Rock. Yes, right by the front door. Yep. They used to have uh, chips with uh, RFID that they used to rate you. As you bet these chips, there was a computer screen that the pit boss had access to, and it could say, see exactly how much you were wagering on every single hand. And I realized that if you took one of those chips and placed it underneath the table, it would also trigger in the betting circle. I wore Under Armour underneath my, my pants and then sewed these chips into the Under Armour and I could lift my, my knee up and it would trigger it as if I bent on top of the circle. That's underneath a, the table. Uh, exactly. Pay attention here, Advantage players. This is exactly the way the mind of an Advantage player works. So you're, <laughs> you automatically get an extra $2,000 onto your bet. You might be spreading from 100 to 500, but it looks like a spread from 2,100 to 2,500, which isn't much of a spread at all. Exactly. Something like that. It looked like I was always betting pretty big. I might change my bet just a little bit, but when I go down to 500, I might put the 1500 and chips underneath the table, so it would still read as if 2000. So my bet, according to their computer system, never looked like it was go just going between 2000 and 3000 all the time, which isn't that big of a variation. Um, and I think that they were very dependent on this technology, so I was able to uh, beat them up pretty good. Casey was one of those players that I noticed in the circuit. He was one of my players that I like to follow because he had all these personas. He looked like a mountain man one day and GQ'd up the next. I didn't really talk very much about uh, the art of implementation because I feel that it would be presumptuous of me to talk about it when Casey, I think, is better at it than I am. I'm a professional blackjack player. I'm forced to evade the most advanced surveillance systems known to man. I'm scrutinized by biometric software. I'm constantly observed by casino personnel. My identity changes every day. This is the price I pay to be a winner. Casey has taken this to some kind of new level. You know, the, the disguises he puts on, uh, the variety and the IDs and all that stuff. I don't know anybody else who does it like that, to that degree. I was getting a lot of heat from the casinos. Changed my look, grew a beard, grew my hair out, changed the way I dress and I've been able to get back into the casino. So I'm gonna take another shot at them and start playing every day and see how things go. Yeah, so we just got booted from the Orleans. Fortunately, he was on a, the tail end of a very good run of cards. Uh, using a $100 unit, we went over 6,000, which was good. What did the guy say to you when he went up to you? Uh, he introduced him, himself to me, he was very friendly. And he said, uh, no more blackjack at any of the Boyd Gaming properties. Did he ask you who you were or no? Nope, didn't ask me who I was. Probably knew I wouldn't tell him. Just to be safe, when we left the property, we jumped in a cab, circled around the block, came back and jumped in the car. When I walk out of a casino and I know I've, I've just either been backed off, or trespassed, I never get in my car. Um, they've got cameras all over, so even if you don't think they're following you, they usually are. Uh, we're gonna head over to Silverton Lodge. It's right on the outskirts of Vegas and work our way north from there. Just do as many hit and runs as we can. In and out, playing aggressively. You know, um, most of these plays I've already been thrown out before, so we're just gonna take dead aim at them until we have to go.
the hair to go or not to go, to cut or not to cut. My hair has been pretty good to me lately. You know, it's uh, provided quite a bit of cover for me. Problem is it's uh, very difficult to handle other day-to-day -day functions looking like the caveman. Fresh out of salon at the Ponds. Got my new haircut, new look. We'll see how it goes. One way to tell, and we should go play. downtown at 7 in the morning. Camouflage place will definitely help your longevity, but eventually, no matter how good you are, you will get caught. So what's the problem? Well, when you come you back here, trespass me now. Because you're not willing to comply with our rules. That's all. What are your rules? Are we asked for ID? I've never been asked for ID. Okay, well that's my rule. How about that? Do you want to comply or something? So do you think you were cheated? Is that what you No, no. You want legitimate. So what, what are you, so you're kicking me out for winning? No, 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 not, not at all. Not at all. You're just scared of the action. It's really important representative of the owner of this property. I hereby inform you that you're trespassing. You're fair to leave. I'm for return. We'll result in arrest and prosecution for trespassing. As per NRI statute, 207.200. Do <sighs> 6 a.m. I spent all night playing at a crappy casino. It's getting really tough. I'm not welcome in the city. Uh, I'm finding myself playing in poor casinos and off shifts at low limits. Uh, I've had two phases of this blackjack career. One, learning how to play, playing at lower limits, building my bankroll, and two, playing at the highest limits as an invited casino guest. But things have changed. Now I'm a known entity and I can't play in Las Vegas really anymore. I've come to a crossroads in my blackjack career and I need to determine if I want to go down this road further, I'm going to have to leave Las Vegas, travel around the country and hit other casinos, or two, I'm going to have to find a new career. Uh, it's not clear to me what the right decision is, but it is clear to me that playing professional blackjack in Las Vegas is no longer an option. There might be another half a million out there for me to earn playing blackjack. There's so many casinos I haven't been to, and I really like to spend one year in the RV, traveling around the country, trying to extract as much as I possibly can out of the game of blackjack. So we're on the road, heading east. Our nationwide blackjack tour begins. We just entered Louisiana. Uh, first town on the border in Shreveport. There's a nice uh, group of casinos here at Boomtown and we're trying to work our way down to New Orleans which is going to be our home base as we take on uh, all the casinos in this region here. I went in to play my third session at Harris, New Orleans and within five minutes the casino manager trespassed me from the property. I hadn't gotten a lot of heat during my first two sessions, but I had a lot of big bets out there. That probably got their attention, and they may have rewound the footage and analyzed my play later and realized I was counting cards. Card counting is professional blackjack 101. It is the first technique an aspiring AP advantage player would learn. Counting is a simple technique where the player assigns values to cards and tracks them as they are dealt. I use the high-low count and assign the value of plus one to two through six, zero to sevens, eights, and nines, and minus one to tens, face cards, and aces. As the cards are dealt in real time, values are added to create the running count. The running count needs to be adjusted by the decks remaining to establish an adjusted count, or true count. The true count determines the player's edge, or mathematical advantage or disadvantage, which in turn determines how much a player wagers on any given hand. When the true count goes up, the player wagers more. When the true count goes down, the player wagers less, or not at all. Changes in true count also determine strategy decisions. Similar hands are often played differently depending on the true count at the time the hand is dealt. On my first hand, I have an ace-seven, 
or soft 18 versus the dealer's 2. A basic strategy would suggest that I stand, but because the true count is plus 3, my strategy indicates that I should double down in this situation. On my second hand I have 6-3 or 9 versus the dealer's 2. Again, basic strategy would suggest that I hit in this situation, but as the true count is plus 3, my strategy suggests that I deviate and double down in this spot. Using this strategy, an advantage player can expect to play with an advantage over the casino of approximately 1%. So, change my look, and I'm going to try playing another casino. I don't have much of a history with them, so that might go well. Shit. <laughs> Now they got a cop up here. Oh, see now he's turning his lights on, coming to get me. Shit, what disturbance? I don't know. That's that telling me the white car and you're in the white car. The casino asked the Kenner, Louisiana police to pull us over outside of the casino. Casino surveillance is trying very hard to get us to show identification, which we're not gonna do. We haven't broken the law. We didn't even play blackjack. I have a uh, supervisor coming to the scene. Okay. And I have one of our supervisors coming to the scene so we can see what we have going. Okay. We can try to resolve this. I have no idea what they're talking about. Well, that's what I'm trying. He just point you, he said the white car, he stopped him, they caused him a disturbance. And that's where we're at right now. So give me a few minutes. Sure. Yeah, we'd love to go, you know. It's... Okay. Now the, uh, the casino manager who trespassed us for the property is now explaining to the officer why his security personnel asked him to pull us over. The greatest thing is the cop has no idea what to do. He went back to them and said, what, what do you want me to charge him with? And I think the cop realizes we haven't done anything wrong. This guy's starting to sweat a little. You have some identification? I do. Can I ask what the problem is? I yeah. just need your ID. OK. Now they just extracted my ID out of me illegally. They finally figured it out. It's me. So new disguise, new look. The two trespassings made it clear that Griffin was aware that I'm in this area. There's no doubt in my mind that they sent out a flyer uh, with my picture on it, or with an updated picture, to the local casinos. Griffin is, is a big thorn in, in any blackjack player's side. Griffin holds itself out as a detective agency that publishes an electronic database of purportedly known cheaters, advantage players, card counters, and other people who casinos might want to know who they are. It's very bad to uh, be a card counter and get placed in the Griffin book. That's like, you know, considered uh, somewhat traumatic the first time you uh, find out that you're actually in the Griffin book. There's the famous black book called the, the Griffin book. This is a rogue copy of it given, given to me by another uh, blackjack player. It's a little bit older version. What they do is they take a picture of you and disseminate it and they file a report you know, this, this card player's here in town and blah, blah, blah. We gotta work against them. It's a game of uh, cat and mouse. You better rotate. Session, session, session. Keep it small and quick. Three casino shifts, so I'm gonna change my outfit, you know, every every few hours. Go in, play 45 minutes, get, get some maximum bets down. Try not to get too much attention. Come back eight hours later, do the same thing. Biloxi's pretty good down here. Nice weather, got a little pool time in at the Beau Rivage. 7,700 at the Hard Rock, and then won 11,800 at Beau Rivage in about 10 minutes. These double deck games are so juicy that it's actually worth it uh, to go in and just play for 15 minutes spreading. You know, you can probably make, uh, the way I'm spreading, you can probably make about 2,000 an hour playing those games. Three days, and 26,228. Yeah, look what you created, huh? My background in gaming? I grew up, my father was a games player. He was a serious uh, backgammon player, poker player, blackjack player, and he was an innovator in these fields. He took the game very seriously, and he played it at the time when very few people knew how to count cards. Now, this is 1960, 61, 62. There were no resources available, but no history of blackjack is complete without mentioning John Scarney, who was the first person, to my knowledge, to ever make a public statement that blackjack was a game that could be beaten. I remember getting on the bus and going to Reno before he was 18 years old. I had 
develop my own counting method based on what I think at the time was actually the first point count ever used in a casino and using the crude basic strategy that I learned from John Scarney's work, I found myself winning. And we gambled around the world in blackjack, backgammon, play blackjack in casinos in Biarritz, in Caen, in Monte Carlo. So as a child, I was able to see uh, some of his adventures playing, traveling to tournaments, traveling to Las Vegas, playing, and it certainly influenced me. By the time uh, he was growing up, it, it, he would see it occasionally, but not on a several hours a day basis, the way I was engaged in my youth. I, I was kind of surprised, really, that he, he uh, took it up and, and uh, got into it to the degree that he did, but maybe it's genetic. We are in Greenville, Mississippi. These places are great because they're so small, they don't really belong uh, to a, a big... Where the hell am I? They're so small, I don't know where the hell they are. They have very unsophisticated surveillance. I was able to shuffle track, which added probably doubled my advantage, maybe more. Shuffle tracking is a great technique used to take advantage of weak shuffles. It can enhance the card counting experience and slightly increase your advantage with less heat than card counting alone. As I count this shoe, I notice a lot of tens and aces are grouped together in the first deck dealt. I mentally label this group of cards, or slug, in the discard tray. As I continue to count the shoe, I notice the consistency of the remainder of the shoe. After counting the entire six deck shoe, I'm able to follow the interesting slugs through a weak one pass shuffle. Notice the two slugs with negative counts of minus 16 and minus eight will be shuffled together to form a two deck slug with a running count of minus 24. The new group of cards is presented at the front of the shoe after the shuffle, and I want to target this slug. I cut a small group of cards from the back of the shoe forward, noted in green. I will play through the green group of cards at minimum bets until I reach the red target slug. With a true count of plus 12 and advantage over 5%, I will increase my bets to the table maximum until I play through the entire slug. Once you begin to include techniques beyond counting in your repertoire, it makes it much more difficult for casino surveillance operators to analyze your play. So it was great. A couple thousand here, a couple thousand there, it adds up. Just went into Sam's Town to play. Uh, they had a great single deck game and I was playing very small, trying not to get any attention. Casino shift manager approached me along with uh, a head of security and another security guard. Now, they were very rude and unpleasant. Told me to color up and that I was being trespassed from the property. And I was very calm and friendly with them. They kind of escorted me towards the door and I said, listen, I've got, I've got these chips, where's the cashier? And the casino shift manager told me that the cashier was in the parking lot and that I had to leave right now. If you come back here, we're gonna arrest you. So I have a meeting with agents from the Mississippi Gaming Commission. It's unlawful for them to uh, kick you out when they know you have chips and tell you that you cannot cash the chips. That's the equivalent of stealing. The gaming agent walked me in today and cashed them with me. He walked into the casino with me so that I could cash them. They might get a fine and uh, they're gonna get some sort of violation. You have to fight this, this web of surveillance and counter surveillance to try and get your bets down. All you want to do is walk into a casino and play and use your mind just like anybody else, but uh, there's a whole web that you can get caught in where once they find you, that they're, they're gonna kick you out. Despite the usual dramas and challenges that you face while you're playing blackjack professionally, such as getting kicked out and the heat, I'm having a blast uh, and enjoying my time in the RV, the freedom, uh, being on the road, had a great winning streak in the south, and now I'm ready to head west. I'm gonna stop in Vegas for a couple of days and then head to California. There's uh, 40 or 50 casinos I haven't even been to. Uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I'm, I'm just excited right now. We're back on the road, heading west to California. Yeah, I started Golden Acorn last night, Indian Casino in the San Diego area. Once we arrived there, there were only two tables open. We had a six-deck game with a maximum bet of 500 and a two-deck game with a maximum bet of 250. So I ended up winning just under 2,000 there. Then we drove to Vieja Casino, walked in there and had two amazing shoes back-to-back. -back. You know, Sky-high counts, it happened so fast, I was able to just go press, 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 and next thing I knew I was at maximum bets. And uh, won 10,500 and uh, probably about half an hour. And 
and now we drove to Barona, so I'm gonna play here today, and it's probably the most high-end casino in the San Diego area. How are you today? Quick session in Barona. They had no problem with me winning 5,000. I think a little bit of cover play went a long way. I think that for sure, the hat and glasses I was wearing were a must because you know they, they practically advertise on the table that they use facial recognition. I've never seen that anywhere. Biometrica is a software company that came into being specifically to provide game protection software to casinos. And they have people they like to keep track of, good guys, bad guys, high rollers, vantage players, cheaters. Gee, here's a new guy in our casino. We checked our databases. We don't know who he is. He's winning a heck of a lot of money. They grab your picture, click, and with a touch of a mouse, it can go up and out to 175 of those surveillance rooms. And the camera will freeze an image and instantly check all the pictures in the database and come up with the most likely matches. The best way to think of it is in terms of we grab an image of your face, and as soon as you grab that, the software measures your face, maybe a thousand different measurements. So it's important to understand that. We use the eyes just as anchor points to start the measurements all around. There's so many measurements there. If you put on a mustache or you put on a beard, you covered up, what, 15% of your measurements? I mean, you could go through a makeup artist and come into a casino dressed as Tootsie instead of Dustin Hoffman, and then you probably won't be seen. But it's unlikely that somebody's going to have so much on him and if they do, what's going to happen is they're not going to need face recognition because look at this guy. They attracted more attention to themselves than our software ever could. <laughs> I'm going to scout it out and figure out what her shift is and how she moves around. It's 12 o'clock, you know, it's 1230. I don't know if I may have just caught the very end of her shift. All right. Well, I'll keep you posted. Bye bye. Well, I just uh, played a quick session at Pachanga, San Diego and stumbled across a um, incredible opportunity. I came across a dealer who, unbeknownst to her, would show me her whole card every single hand. The game is such a slam dunk where this could be easily a six-figure opportunity. Whole carding means that the dealer is exposing their uh, whole card in blackjack. Normally that's, that's supposed to be dealt face down, but sometimes the way the dealer takes it out of the shoe or the way they check for the blackjack, some sort of mannerism that they have, the player might be able to see it. Whole card play is one of the best things that they could do nowadays, I believe. Anytime you're in a card game and you know the value or even some partial information about what you know, a hidden card is likely to be, then you could adjust your strategies accordingly to get a much bigger edge than you would have through counting cards. Approximately one to 2% of dealers use poor or sloppy techniques, which can be exploited by advantaged players. This dealer is unknowingly flashing his whole card. Given the extra information, I adjust my playing strategy accordingly. On my first hand, I have a nine and would normally hit against a 10, but given the extra information that the whole card is the six of clubs, I change my play and double down. The whole card information provides an advantage of about 10%, so I flat bet the table maximum every hand. On my second hand, I have 14. I would normally hit 14 against a 10, but I'm really playing my 14 against the dealer's 16 and opt to stand according to the whole card strategy. The erratic plays combined with consistent bet amounts make the technique more difficult for casino operators to detect. We read up and we consult with attorneys and, and find out before we even play it, is this something we can do legally? And since it is, we had no qualms just to you know, hitting that game and others as, as hard as we could. My last session with Pachanga went really well. I played uh, an eight hour shift on Graveyard um, with my favorite dealer who happens to show me her whole card almost every hand. I followed her around, figured out her table rotation and when she would be there. I played a little bit before, she'd rotate in a little bit after and it went really well. Uh, I did get a fair amount of heat. They knew I wasn't counting and they couldn't figure out what was going on. 95,800. I think a total of six days of play. Not bad at all. I started out strong in Mississippi and Louisiana with a series of big wins. The winning continued in San Diego, followed by a six figure whole card score. Uh, this trip really couldn't have started better. I'm up already over $250,000. Pulled in Palm Springs last night to Morongo, crushed him, won over 20,000. We drove down further into Palm Springs to Fantasy Springs. At this point, I took off my sports coat and my jacket and my nice outfit and then put on a wig and some camo pad and changed into a black shirt and shorts. I headed on deeper into Palm Springs, went to spa, had a quick clobbered 
beat up for 5,500, got some heat. As soon as I raised my bet, they came over and uh, booted me, said that told me I was a known advantage player. You know we're getting deep when we're out on dirt roads and you have no cell phone reception. This casino was a trip just because we're so far out in the boonies. Started playing, another gentleman sat down and he was playing $5 a hand. Another kid came up and had four $1 chips and I went on a bit of a hot streak and cleaned out their whole rack. Got a lot of attention. I mean, a $1,500 bet in Vegas terms isn't very big, but out in a place like this, uh, you know, created a, quite a crowd. We've landed in Reno. I've um, got my list and I planned out my route of all the casinos I want to hit. I'm looking at about uh, 15 to 20 casinos I'm going to play. They've been hit hard over the years by a lot of card counters and teams and professionals. It's pretty hard to, to get down some big bets. I need your driver's license and your social security card. And just remember to be in a casino in the state of Nevada. You have to have a government does the casino have a right to demand identification and have it produced? The answer is no. The casinos are always trying to get your ID. They want you to have a player's card. So security guards will say, you know, it's illegal not to have ID. Complete horseshit. Well, you know, no, sir, I know the law. I'm the casino manager. The law states that in the state of Nevada, you must have a government ID on your person to be in a casino. It's just this simple. It's a lie. It's a lie. Let's see if I can think of another way to say it. It's untrue. Okay? There is nothing in God's green earth that says you have to have papers anywhere in the United States merely to be there. If you get in or cash out more than $10,000 in cash, then you do have to show ID because they have to file this form called a cash transaction report. Everybody knows what to do if you're over 10,000, but uh, when you're sort of above 3,000 where they typically internally ask for an ID for their own internal records, uh, but they're not legally obligated to get an ID, uh, nobody really knows how to handle those transactions. I'm over 21. I'm over 21. May I see your ID? I mean, they're having play. I will keep the chips, otherwise, if you cannot provide ID. You bring ID? You keep the chips? Yes. Why so? Because you cannot provide ID, so we're going to keep them as long. Once you bring the ID, I'll give it back to you. Okay. I didn't really get ID there to cash in chips. Yeah, I Is it a lie? You have to give your ID? Yes. It is. Even to cash out the small amount as well. It doesn't matter. If you look under 35, I need to verify that you're 30, yeah, uh, under 30. But they just served me a beer. They didn't ask for ID? They shouldn't. They shouldn't have. Normally, they're not supposed to ask for your ID unless they're charging you with a crime. But if they're smart, they'll say, well, hey, we're just trying to keep track to make sure you, because we may have to file a currency transaction report. You know, they cash out 8250 for me. Without, a, without an ID, but they basically told me they wanted to file a suspicious activity report. Then they tried to ask me for my name for that report and I didn't give it to them. But yeah, it's like drugs. When they want your ID, just say no. Uh, you're welcome to use a weapon because you can't put a blood jacket. You're not a blood jacket? No. You have an ID? Uh, no, I don't. You know what happens is, what's wrong? Unfortunately, if you guys don't have an ID, I have to uh, 86 years old. I've now been kicked out on nearly every shift from every casino. So I've, I feel like I've done a good job extracting value from the city. I'm actually probably right about expectation for the amount I've played. I got logged in a lot of hours. We are in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. The heat is through the roof. I'm gonna get one more session in and, uh, and then we're out of here. 
The good news is Reno Tahoe has been a pretty good area. I'm up about 35,000 after 11 days of play in Reno. Tahoe's been a bit of a grind, but I've gotten a lot of hands in here and came out ahead. So I'm feeling good having one in each area, and they never got my ID. This is like one of the best blackjack games I've seen in a long, long time. I was only planning to stop by. I thought it might be a one session place. And I'm so surprised by the conditions that uh, uh, it's juicy. They don't seem to give a shit who I am. They don't belong to Griffin or anything like that. Uh, they don't use any facial recognition software. And they don't seem to mind that I'm spreading from the minimum to the maximum. I mean, it's an ideal situation. For the day, I am down uh, 30, about just under 50,000. I'm gonna take a little break, run a simulation on the game just to make sure my numbers are all up to date. This is like the needle in the haystack to play here and then to take a big loss, I'm gonna have to play it like 20 more casinos to try and win it back. That's the benefit of betting bigger. If you have a big win, it takes you to the next level. Big loss, you really have to grind and grind to get your money back. Blackjack players understand the concept of risk they understand the fact that there are going to be fluctuations, there's going to be ups and downs, but they want to control the risk. People ask me, well, what's different about new card counters that you can uh, make this work? And it's a really interesting question. I think we're all pretty wacky. We have niches where we get really good at doing a simple math under pressure. There's no gut feeling. There's no, I just busted three hands in a row. There is an exact right play and a wrong play. Other people will analyze a situation and think, oh my God, I don't want this outcome and I know that outcome is possible, so I won't do that. And we analyze that situation. We say, well, if I did that, a million times, how many times would that outcome happen and how many times would the other outcome happen? And it's a really different way of looking at the world. I went back and I ended up playing a, a marathon graveyard shift of nine and a half hours. I bought it for 5,000, lost 2,500. I was down to my, you know, down to 2,500 left. I run, ran 2,570,000. Had a bet and they couldn't pay it. No point. So we just got escorted out by Bear River Security. Unlike recent uh, security escorts, this one was quite a bit more friendly. They gave us a courtesy escort all the way to the RV because we cashed out so much at the casino cage. It's so pretty up here. What a beautiful drive. We are up in the northwest corner of California in Humboldt County. Quite a few little Indian casinos scattered around here. I've never played in this area of the country, so I didn't really know what to expect, and I've stumbled across a couple of really good games. We were gonna come up the west coast of California, into Oregon, up to Seattle, uh, before we go east. I really enjoyed the northwest. Uh, it's beautiful up here, and I keep stringing together winds, uh, so I'm feeling good about my play. Unfortunately, I am getting a little bit lonely, I think uh, two to three months here in the RV is starting to take its toll on me. And I thought maybe with the excitement of travel and the usual wins and losses that go along with playing, I'd be fine. But uh, I am getting a little bit lonely. And I think uh, a good cure for that would be picking up my dogs in the Bay Area. I'm gonna drive down to San Francisco, load up the dogs, bring them along for the rest of the trip. Uh, hit the Thunder Valley this weekend. Should have a pretty good session there uh, in terms of the ability to bet big this weekend and then work my way to the Midwest. I think the Mohawk and the outfit definitely helped a lot. Booked a small win, just under 5,000, but opted to call it a night. Friday night's a little bit busier. There's more action going on. The place was kind of dead in there. Uh, I don't want to get burned tonight and thrown out uh, betting 2,000 when I could bet 10,000. Hi. I I just had the casino steal my per personal property uh, in the amount of almost forty thousand. No, I let they surrounded me with security. They trespassed me, and then I was in the parking lot in my RV trying to get a hold of the sheriff. They came up and started giving me a hard time, saying I wasn't leaving. So I, I was leaving. I'm just trying to call the police to handle it myself. Uh, I'm about three blocks away from the casino I just left. 
All right, they're gonna have a deputy come here. So, you now the sheriff went in there, was sympathetic to me, and said, listen, I'll help you go get your chips. They were doing everything they could just to be uh, as difficult as possible. You gotta leave the properties. I'm not gonna give you a whole lot of time here. Elk Grove County Jail is 130 miles that way. <laughs> they just gave me a real hard time. I didn't even play a hand, just bought in, and they just, well, real nasty. Salt Lake City, we are in an area that is completely isolated from any casinos. Just drive it across the country. Made it to Nebraska. Uh, it's been a long night. Done about 500 and something mile drive so far. We are in Iowa. I played a few sessions. I had a session at Maristar, a couple sessions at Horseshoe, and I'm just in the middle of a tailspin losing streak. 15,000 last night, you know, 10,000 yesterday, 18,000 the day before that. From a mathematical perspective, it's not really that big of a deal, but you know, it's not always easy to detach yourself emotionally from it. Just had a very bad experience at Harris. Tried to get me into a back security room, but they couldn't give me a reason why. They just come up to random people and say, go into some back office with me, and that's what we want to do? That's what we can do. We have the right to do that. You're leaving the Iowa area. I've been asked not to play to Maristar, and I've been trespassed from the Horseshoe and Harris. This was pretty much a losing city for me. After five days battling these three casinos in St. Louis, just feeling a bit frustrated. I'm down 3,000. I feel like in, in five days, I've logged in over 40 hours of play. Got ahead, lost it, got behind 10, 15,000, won it all back, got down again. It's really just been a grind. We're heading through Northern Iowa. We had one casino on our list. Unfortunately, I used a, a casino guidebook from last year. Showed up and the casino had been turned into a theater. They must have gone bankrupt in the last six months. Either way, it's actually good to have a night off. I've played already three, if not four casinos today. Um, been freaking losing like crazy. Sit, sit back, take it easy, have a couple beers, watch a movie, lick my wounds, move on. And uh, it sucks. I've been on this blackjack train for so long, I just felt like I might as well ride it to the end of the station. When you put in that time and effort, get the RV, travel around, have the bankroll, deal with all the stress of getting kicked out and treated like a criminal, and you end up losing 100,000. That's brutal. I don't think a lot of people in the world could deal with working two months, 10 hours a day, and end up losing money. There aren't that many jobs you can do that. But if you want to be a professional blackjack player, play every day for years. You want to play five years, say, this is what I'm going to do. Travel around the country, play every single casino. You can bet your ass that you're gonna go a two month period and you're gonna be down. Just playing our route to the Midwest. Basically the whole Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan. Not a lot of good casinos, but a lot of places worth peeking into. I like coming to these out of the way places. Usually you can find good games. Um, they tend to be less networked with other casinos. So it's easier for me to get some action. Majestic Pines Casino, Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Uh, I lost a thousand bucks, which again is not a big deal in terms of the absolute value of the loss, but I went to two hands at 50 and I lost uh, eight of them in a row. It's just brutal. For safety reasons, I only travel with a portion of my bankroll, which is fine unless I go through a sustained losing stretch, which I've done. So today I flew from O'Hare to Las Vegas, uh, picked up 200000 and flew back two hours later. There's nothing illegal about carrying large amounts of money domestically. You can cross state lines and there's no problem. The, the only thing that happens is people tend to freak out when they see a lot of cash and then they report it to various agencies and they, they immediately think that if you have you know, more than 10000 in cash, you're a drug dealer or you're doing something illegal. 200000 I can put on me and I feel pretty comfortable. I don't feel like I'm bulging. I don't feel like people are looking at me or anything's funny. Joliet, Illinois. Didn't even get in there. I got right to the, the gate of the boat and security said, we're, we just got a call, we're expecting you. I can't let you in. I've had a pretty good run of play all the way through 
from Chicago. And then we played Fortress East of Chicago and Indiana. Played all over Indiana. And the casinos have been very close together and they've started to communicate and take a lot of photos of me. Various casinos have taken down the license plate and description of the RV. When I walked in there, they had a file of probably 12 different photos of me all from the last week. So it's getting a little tricky right now. Stepping out of the realm of state-regulated casinos that are not Indian-related and onto a reservation casino can be as different as deciding that you want to have dinner in downtown Las Vegas or dinner in Liberia. The tribes in the United States are considered domestic nations. They have the rights of sovereign governments similar to the states in some extent to some extent even greater than the state. They have you tied up hook, line, and sinker and can do their will upon you physically and financially. Bad place to be. Other casinos can do that too, but you have civil recourse. The difference with the Indian casino is there's no, that, that threat of recourse isn't there, so they might feel much more free to do it. Uh, you have about the same amount of rights um, that a U.S. citizen would have in Mexico. The heat is so high right now that um, each casino is notifying all the other casinos in the area. Griffin's on to us. Uh, I think the only solution right now is to break our trail. So rather than following our route through up through northern Michigan and Canada, I think that we need to probably just break off and do a long driving session and move a couple of states over. After traveling across five states, I showed up in New York at Turning Stone. I booked a small win, but more importantly, I was able to log in a, a multi-hour session, which meant that they weren't expecting me. Just played my second big session in the Connecticut area. I'm gonna go play another graveyard session tonight and play a little smaller, just try and stay under the radar and, and book a small win, basically to regain my confidence and grind out a little bit more EV. Travel is a big part of the game moving around constantly. And it's an aspect of the game that it, it makes it difficult for some people. At first, the travel can be fun, but sometimes the travel is very uh, grueling, <laughs> you know, constantly being on the road. We just had a, uh, a minor disaster. The RV broke down in the Mohegan Sun. We we're having trouble finding someone that could come out and fix it. And towing this thing is a nightmare. And to make matters worse, bankroll was secured in a locked put place that you could only get to when the car was on. Uh, but we did finally find a guy, a mobile truck service that could come out and as I suspected, the starter went bad. One of the amazing things about Casey, as far as I'm aware, he, he's, a, he's a lone wolf. That's a tough road. You can't really specialize. You have to be a master of everything or you know, jack of all trades at least. To survive as a lone wolf is, is very rare. Basically, Connecticut was a disaster. $100,000 downswing. So then I come to Atlantic City, drop down my uh, my bets a bit, only to have a really bad first night here. New Jersey has said that card counting is legal and that the uh, casinos cannot exclude card counters. There's no regulation saying they can kick them out, but they do have these horrible regulations, such as changing the stakes for a single person at a table. Pretty rough day today, played three sessions. Had three $10,000 losses back to back to back. As of this morning at around noon, I was up 20,000. 
I lost that back plus another 30,000 for a $50,000 downturn plus 8,000 that I lost last night. This blackjack trip for me is like a company. It's a business that I'm running and I need to place, get as many of these bets in and create as much expected value. But along the way, I have to deal with fluctuations, which is the risk. And I don't want to end up tapping out at any point and going bankrupt. When you start losing, you need to buckle down and grind it back out. And you just have to let go, you know? You, you get your bets in and then uh, the cards fall as they may and you just really have to hope that uh, you can ride out the storm. So right now, this is all about riding out the storm. By far the most important characteristic of someone who's gonna be a, s a success at this is, uh, is emotional control. You can't be subject to emotional involvement that will take your losses and uh, turn them into your downfall. Trying to fill up the flying J. We're out of propane. It's been a rough two nights. Ran out of propane. It's been freezing in Atlantic City. Uh, spent two nights shivering with the dogs. I wrapped them up in a blanket and used them to keep me warm. The good news is we're heading south, so hopefully it's only going to get warmer from here. Uh, it's nice to be down in Florida. The weather's a little bit better. The losing seems to have slowed down a bit. I'm starting to log in a couple of winning sessions playing here in the Tampa, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood area. I'm gonna jump on a plane and hop over the Bahamas, check out the Atlantis. Uh, they get some decent action over there, so it should be a good spot. Just arrived at Atlantis Casino and Resort. They, my first session at the casino, went straight in and played 14,500. Last 24 hours in the Bahamas has just been awesome. Uh, I've gone some pool time, some R&R. &R. I've been able to get uh, solid table max bets without ever even disclosing my ID. They've got a table out by the pool. I've been able to get a date afternoon session in. I had a great situation last night in a shoe game. A few aces came out and I was able to shuffle track a sequence and it worked out perfectly. I basically got three aces in a row and they all landed on my hand and I won all three hands at maximum bet. That was fantastic. Sequencing is an advantage play technique which involves following a string or sequence of cards. Keep in mind that aces are very valuable to the player in the game of blackjack, and that a player has a 53% advantage when dealt an ace as his first card. In this example, a sequence of three consecutive aces is observed. The location of aces are mentally noted in the discard tray. In the following hand, a sequence of key cards are observed and memorized. These are the cards that will precede the aces in the following shoot. In this example, the key cards in order are the nine of diamonds, jack of diamonds, king of diamonds, and seven of spades. While the cards will get shuffled, the sequence gets shuffle tracked and is cut to the front of the shoe. After the first three key cards appear in order, the bet is raised to table max in anticipation of the arrival of the ace sequence. three aces shortly follow in order. Sequencing is a powerful technique when the opportunity presents itself. There's very little heat as few casinos have the ability to detect this method. After getting up 600,000, I've had a dreadful winter. Playing every day for three months, I've given back over 300,000. Finally, I've strung together six wins in a row, including a $77,000 win in the Bahamas, and I feel like things are starting to turn for the better. We're basically on the home stretch of this giant circle we've done around the country. So I just got off the phone with my dad. I think I piqued my dad's interest talking to him over the last year and a half, and he told me today that uh, he's gonna join us through New Mexico and Arizona. It's gonna be fun for me to pull him out of retirement and have a little bit of camaraderie. Good to see you. Okay, here we here. are in Albuquerque, ready to start our venture, huh? You ready for some work? All right, let's do it. All right. Yeah, it's fun having my dad in the RV. You know, we uh, he lives in California, I live in Las Vegas, I've been on the road a lot. It's good for us to spend time together. You can't write down the states in advance. All right, that's not fair. Go ahead. No. 
You, you lost your, your score keeping. I'm keeping score now. And I'm driving. You can't do that. So when we're together, it's just non-stop games, non-stop competition. All right. The next alphabetical state is Indiana. Stop writing it down. You oh, I'm not supposed to write your answer down? Do you challenge me? Yeah, my dad and I uh, are very competitive. You know, he's been a professional games player for a large portion of his life and has this competitive spirit about him, which I've probably inherited. We were playing a, a, a state game and we just found evidence that uh, there was a little bit of foul play going on here. <laughs> but he was busted. Abused the score. <laughs> Privileges. <laughs> <laughs> the competition got out of control to the point where he's accusing me of stuff, I'm accusing him of stuff, and uh, it got so heated that we actually had to quit the game in the middle. It's double after split, re-split aces, six deck game, two, they cut off a deck and a half. This isn't his idea of like flying in to the airport and getting picked up by a limo and playing golf and going out to nice dinners. We're grinding it in an RV driving across the desert in places with $500 maximum bets. So it's not really glorious here. That we need a signal. So we're going to be playing these shoe games. If you get a count that's good, I want to know so I can come and play. If you can do a call in, it's okay. Because if you don't know the count, you can just come in betting big. You know, that's classic team theory. But you know, most casinos have seen that. So it's not some original idea anymore. The man that invented team play uh, uh, is uh, Frank, uh, are we calling him Mal Francesco? Yeah. Okay. My name is, I have three names. Uh, in the blackjack world, it's Al Francesco. My original real name is Frank Chapani. My legal name is Frank Salerno. Uh, the people in the blackjack world understand why we have different names. He was the guy that years ago, like, you know, before when I was still in uh, grade school, he went into the casinos in Las Vegas and just watched what people do. Where do people put their hands? What do they do with their hands? And he made up these signals that were the basis of team play and these signals, many of which we still use today. Put your hand into your hair, but like, you were sitting there playing yesterday, Dan, like this? Mm -hmm. But if the count is good, go up. My hand will either be on my, on my chin or if, if it's my chin means means nothing if I'm like this at the table, but if, I'm t if, if my fingers are touching my hair at all, it's, uh, it's a good situation. All right. Really like this area. I haven't really done any in-depth play in the New Mexico region, and I'm finding some really good games. And That's a good game. And I was getting some heat. Not heat, but he was watching me. You've established yourself as a, I mean, they were talking about you. He's hitting 13s against fives and sixes and standing on 15s against sevens and eights. And you get up from the table, that guy played horribly. I mean, and the woman says, yeah, I mean, he was just awful. <laughs> and they're talking to the pit boss and the dealer that way. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> That's what they said about me after I left? Yeah. It's a good game. They're dealing s five decks. Uh, I think you should go back in there and punish them. All right. We're continuing through Arizona. I've got my father with me, and we're playing at Camp Verde at Cliff Castle. And I had a solid two or three decks I got to play with in a really high count situation. This winter was the worst losing streak I'd ever sustained. I played every day for three months and was down over $325,000. I've been able to maintain the momentum that I had in the South and in the Bahamas and Florida through Arizona and New Mexico and recovered about 60 to 70 percent of that back. That was quite a shoe. The shoe after was better. What? My very last shoe. You know, blackjack, I think, is probably ran its course, but then if you look at it, it's been going around since 60, so how much farther is the course going to go? Well, uh, back in 2000, I was at a gaming conference. I ran in Arnold Snyder, and uh, we got talking. I said, Arnold, I think that blackjack is going to be history, is being attackable in five years. Well, that was 2005, so obviously I was wrong. The blackjack players are smarter than the casino operators. Fact of life. Those guys are watching somebody else's money. We're playing our own. There's, while the casinos are sleeping and those guys are at home, we're thinking. 
There's always a new move coming along. Right now, people in blackjack are making as much money as they made five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. There's always something else out there. Not just card counting, but there's always going to be something. Yeah, I, I think the future of advantage play is very bright. The people that adapt continue to make money and still make money to this day. Every year, somebody tells me blackjack is dead, and every year, advantage play has just gotten better and better and better. I don't see in the reasonable, foreseeable future that blackjack is going to be dead to any of us. For us, the, the clock never stops. We're, you know, working all the time. And so the game goes on. Coming back to Las Vegas, I'm exhausted. The last 12 months I spent grinding in casinos, working in a hostile environment, it really took its toll on me. The wins, the losses, I'm glad this chapter of my career was profitable. Oh, I, I, he's taken things that I did and gone to the next level with them. He's ambitious and he's done very well and has no reason not to be successful. But I hope he realizes that there are better things to do in the long term with his life. But I think it should form a, a good basis uh, some good experience and uh, things that'll carry over no matter what he does. It really makes no difference where Casey uh, ends up. The skills that he's learned from Blackjack, where does that lead? Only the future will tell. There are people in life who are going to be successful, as his dad was. And uh, Casey's very much like his father that way. I still like the rush of beating a casino, but for me, the game has changed. I'm no longer you know, a welcome high roller. I'm now trying to fly under the radar, having to work really hard just to, to play. And it's, uh, it's tough, it's a super grind. And it's not what I wanna spend the rest of my life doing. I'm thankful that uh, I had this experience. I'm thankful that uh, I've got skills that I should hopefully be able to take to a new phase in my life. And I don't know what the next step is, but it's become clear to me at this point that uh, professional blackjack's behind me. Hey, CB, what's up? It's Casey, just checking in. Just got a call from my dad. He's down in Florida, was playing golf, and came across a whole card game. Uh, he said it might be a six-figure opportunity, so I'm jumping on the next plane and heading down there. Hope all is well with you. Give me a ring. <laughs>